Hello, good morning everyone from EAU in Milan 2023. I'm Nicola Motte, the chair of the Prostate Cancer Panel Guidelines at EAU, and my pleasure to be here with... And I'm Phil Cornford. I'm uh, the current vice chair on the EAU Prostate Cancer Panel. So Phil, what, what's new in the guidelines? Well, I think there's been a lot of excitement over the idea that there might be early detection for people with prostate cancer. Uh, the new uh, recommendation that we begin to investigate whether the process is possible to detect prostate cancer early as part of the EU's new cancer strategy has caused interest. And this morning we heard about Praise You, which is a new project to look at identifying men to work out whether it's possible to get people to engage and to identify people who might have prostate cancer at an early stage. Well, that's a, that's a major change because now we begin to think again about a sort of systematic screening which is risk adapted. Uh, one of the one of the major limits we had with this systematic screening, or so-called systematic screening, was over treatment. Uh, and and we mustn't make the mistakes of the past. It's quite clear that when PSA was first introduced, we overdiagnosed and overtreated people with low risk disease. And as a consequence, in this year's guidelines, we said that for people with low risk disease, the only recommended treatment is active surveillance. And that's an attempt to try and break the link between diagnosing prostate cancer and overtreatment. There is a recommendation to consider active surveillance in people with low risk intermediate, but for them, it's still an option for other treatments. But for people with true low risk disease, then active surveillance should be the default outcome for those patients. And even worse, it's a strong recommendation, uh, the, the only recommendation we have now for low risk disease. Yes. And that's a major point. Yes, and that is very new. Uh, I think that will uh, cause some discussion. Uh, so? But, but that's the point. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt about the data. Uh, the risk of dying of low-risk prostate cancer at 10 and 15 years is 5 and 8% if you are untreated. And if you have a radical prostatectomy, less than 1%. So it's massive over-treatment uh, if we treat these people. And this was a mistake we made in the past, and we mustn't do that in the future. Otherwise, we will lose the opportunity to find those people who have got disease that needs treating. And that becomes really important. That's absolutely, that's probably one of the major points and major change we made this year. Probably a second major change is this uh, staging process with this magic PET PSMA, the so-called magic PET PSMA. What did you, what have you yeah, written there? I mean, <laughs> I think that with, with uh, PSMA and staging, uh, particularly for high risk disease, we know it's more accurate. And I don't think there's any doubt that the data proves that it's more accurate. The problem is that by finding disease, you increase the lead time so much. And the temptation is to alter treatment as a consequence. And when you read the papers, you realize that it changes practice in 35 or 50 percent of, of cases. Are we happy with this? Happy. And the problem is that there is no evidence to change that practice. So although it is changing practice, we have advised strongly against doing that because there is no data for us to be able to tell patients what the outcome will be of that change in practice. We know that if you have a metastatic disease found on bone scan and CT scan, it's clear what the treatment is. It is not clear that if you've got two spots outside of the pelvis and you would otherwise have been suitable for radical treatment, that you should be treated like a metastatic patient or a localized patient. And because that isn't clear, we need 
over time as a community to collect data to try and work out what the outcome would be for these patients. And then you'd be in a position to be able to say exactly what is happening and therefore what treatments were appropriate. But at the moment, we don't have that data. And at the moment, we're still saying that you shouldn't use this information to change practice. That's a major point too that might make a lot of people very disappointed, but evidence-based, that's the only thing we can say. Regarding, regarding images, isn't there something with, missing with the MRI? Because we are all saying MRI has to be done before biopsy. We've discussed the practice based on the MRI result. Isn't there anything missing there regarding MRI? I don't think there's so much missing, but I think that there is a caution to be had. So I think for MRI, one of the things we need to be very careful about is the quality of the MRI, both the way those pictures are captured, the way the machines are set up needs to be standardised, and the way it is reported needs to be standardised. And we need a system that would allow us to compare what happens in your local unit with the best centres. And our problem so, is that at the very best, it is a powerful tool to avoid detecting low-risk disease. But at the worst, you just get a lot of pyrad 3 lesions called because the uh, radiologist is unwilling to come off the fence and then people get a lot of biopsies as a consequence. And so I think for people who are practising when they go home after this meeting, it's really important to look at the rate of PIRAD3 that you're being that are being quoted and what the pickup rate is for that group and to have a conversation with your radiologist in a MDT type forum in order to be able to give feedback so that you continue to improve and you hit the best results, which are really impressive. They are impressive. Just need to be expended for the avian everybody, yeah, for everyone. Probably one of the the third most important change we made is for the a subgroup of the locally advanced disease, where with a stampede paper published two years ago. Maybe you might elaborate a little bit on that. So it became clear that in the subgroup from stampede that were high risk and not currently metastatic. So that meant that they had a PSA of over 40. They had T3 or T4 disease. DRE-based. DRE-based. DRE based. And, uh, and a high Gleason grade. If you had two of those three people, patients, you were still put into stampede. And some of those patients were treated with abiraterone. You, you, uh, CN1 were also... CN like CN1, CN1 were were also, also allowed. allowed. Based on CT. Yes, but not based on... Not based, based on, on PSMA. PSMA. And those group had a survival benefit from giving them abiraterone early. And that is new. We know that intensification of treatment for people with proven metastatic disease, have, we've got a variety of trials that show that there, there is benefit. It's interesting because in the same group, there's no benefit for docetaxel and Stampede also presented that recently. So it's quite clear that these groups should be considered for abiraterone for two to three years as part of this setup. In Stampede, it was two years of Abbey and three years of ADT. Yes. And only for these subgroups. Just it's not for group. all the high risk. It's no. for a very specific subgroup of high risk. And should this mean that the standard of care for CN1 or for this very high risk uh, locally uh, advanced to be provocative? So this is very provocative uh, because clearly there are people who have offered radical prostatectomy to patients in this situation in the past. And we have previously talked about multimodality therapy. But I think this changes the situation. If you've got clearly uh, CN1 disease on a CT scan and not a PSMA bet, then these patients should be have a good discussion about radiotherapy and abiraterone rather than surgical intervention. 
accepting that there are ongoing trials. And yeah. if you consent someone and you put them in a trial in this situation, that's, that's perfect. absolutely perfect. perfect. Yeah. And probably the final million dollar change we made is about the treatment of M1 disease with the two major trials that were already published and are nowadays available. That's a triplet therapy. Yes. Well, I think the thing that we that was clear from both Arisen and from uh, the Peace study is that if you are going to have docetaxel, then you should give it with a novel hormone treatment in addition. We know that when only docetaxel was available, probably 20 to 25% of patients were treated with docetaxel. And what we're saying is that those group should have triple therapy. What we're not saying is that everybody who has uh, hormone-sensitive prostate cancer should have triple therapy. That's, that's not what we're saying. But we are saying that if you were going to give them docetaxel as your preferred option, you should now give them triple therapy. Well, the message is very important. The, this, these two points are very important. The standard of care is not a triplet for no. everybody. Docetaxel on top of ADT is gone, definitely. And probably there are clearly some patients that deserve the triplet. Yes. The question is, we were not able to clarify who. No, it's not absolutely clear from the studies exactly whom gains all the benefit. Uh, I suspect that this will be a case-by-case -case discussion and people will talk about how fit patients are, how, how extensive their disease is, and how much they are prepared to tolerate the additional toxicity for a definite benefit of, nov of triplet therapy over docetaxel, but no clear evidence of a definite benefit of triplet therapy over the combination of a novel hormone plus ADT for people with metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate yeah. cancer. Fully agree. So I, I, I believe we covered all the major change we made in the guidelines this year. And as you can see, there's a lot of things that are ongoing and a lot of trials that are ongoing. So many trials are published since the text is finalized, but they are not yet in the guidelines. So that's for 2024. Yeah, and we look forward uh, to discussing that in Paris. Absolutely. Thank you, Phil. Thank you.